title, Vigilance Mandate. <clears throat> Principle. Scripture teaches most Christians will not make the rapture because their focus will be on the radical conditions coming on the earth. And these radical conditions will be <clears throat> consist of upheavals, conditions of prosperity, and conditions of sin. Focus will be on these conditions, and they will not be able to focus on the time of the progression of the Lord's appearing. Turn to Luke, 21st chapter, verse 25 to 26. take a look at some of these conditions that will totally take up people's total focus. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. <coughs> Men's hearts, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on earth, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. People are going to be so caught up with the upheavals <coughs> that are going to take place on the earth, and the desperate situations that they will find themselves in, they will not be able to compose themselves to allow the spirit give them understanding of what's taking place. Turn to Matthew 24, verses 7 to 8. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. People's focus are going to be these are people, ethnic strife, wars, geological upheavals, such that they won't, they will not allow themselves to open up to the Holy Spirit. Verse, drop down to verses 11 and 12, same chapter. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because of injustice, because of the things that are taking place that become unresolved to them, they become offended. Turn your back on the commitment to the Lord. Revelation, the third chapter, verses 15 to 17. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, or would thou work cold or hot? Then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind, and naked. Pursuit of wealth, pursuit of having arrived at a place where they become a, an authority unto themselves, no longer open to the influence of the Holy Spirit, totally oblivious to the time of the Lord's appearing. Luke, 21st chapter, verse 34 to 35. So we're looking at these simultaneous conditions of chaos, conditions of upheaval, and conditions of prosperity. Luke, the 21st chapter.
verse 34 and 35. Take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So what he's warning about is the conditions that we're entering into. Conditions of tremendous upheavals, conditions of unimagined prosperity, conditions of unimagined sin. Revelation 2nd chapter verses 18 to 25. Unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, if she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed of and them that commit adultery with her, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, can be left behind and will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden that which you have already hold fast till I come now we said that John went to two different conditions he went into the future and then he went into eternity in the future he writes to the churches that will exist at that day about the things that are happening and going to happen at that time, Jesus openly talks about coming again, appearing to the church, taking them out of the earth. It makes no sense if you look at it from the standpoint of this being historical. <clears throat> Jesus speaking to a church about coming to them, protecting them from the tribulation period when he knew that it wouldn't take place until thousands of years in the future makes no sense. This has to be the church that will exist in the future. Seven churches, which are the core examples, and he mentions all the churches will know. So it's talking about the seven churches that Asia Minor represents the condition that all the churches in the future will represent. Those that are totally committed those that are involved in things that cause them to spot their robes, those that are not looking for his coming because they're involved in other pursuits, such as the, the, the portion that are at Thyatira. And the understanding here is that a good percentage of them are waiting for him, separate, uh, sanctified, doing what they should do, and a certain percentage of them have given themselves over to this woman, Jezebel, to be corrupted. And this is what he's addressing. So we find here, and during the disintegration of this society, God's going to gather the churches into communities, restore a 
apostles and prophets and send messages to the churches so that they can prepare themselves for what is coming. <clears throat> this particular church, like the other churches, have issues, they have problems. <clears throat> Revelation, the second chapter, verses 12 to 16. Problems with deceiving leadership. And to the angel of the church at Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. So he's talking here about the church that existed at the time of John. Antipas was a historical figure who was martyred for his faith. <coughs> but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. So what he's addressing here is doctrine, leaders, have infiltrated the church and they are teaching heretical doctrine. Doctrine that's causing those that believe in it to fall away. <clears throat> so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Another false doctrine. Repent, or else I will come unto, you, unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So he's talking to them about things that are waiting for them to the throne of the Father. <coughs> a whole new identity. He's talking to them openly about coming. So the church at this point has been prepared to understand the totality <clears throat> of what the rapture means. It means that the Lord is going to appear to his people. When he appears to his people, they're going to be changed from mortal to immortal, from corrupted to glory, glorified state. They will go into the presence of the Father. They will receive the fullness of the adoption. This is something you could not teach in the churches today because they don't accept it. <clears throat> He's warning them that the satanic influence is going to cause a good percentage of them to be left behind. Matthew 24, verses 4 to 5. answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Deception is the hallmark of the sign of his coming. <coughs> Christians falling under the deceit, deceitful teachings of perverted leaders. Scripture teaches only those who depend on the Spirit and the guidance of the Spirit from the start to the climax will be ready for the rapture. In other words, those who reach a stage of maturity at the time of the signs and consistently depend upon the renewing process which inculcates the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they continue with this dependence to the end. In other words, uninterrupted, they will be ready for the conditions that are going to come on the earth. 
Now, what's interesting is the emphasis that the Lord puts on the conditions. <coughs> In Matthew 24, verse 7, He says, For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Diverse places. All these things are going to happen in diversity. In other words, the earth, human society, is going to be fragmented. And in its splitting up, these things are going to happen. You're going to have some places where there's total calamity, chaos. You're going to have other places where prosperity reigns. And the individuals in these diverse places are going to experience <coughs> different things. And the things they experience, if they can't overcome, are going to be the things that keep them from the rapture. Now turn to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Daniel, the seventh chapter, in verse seven, read about the fourth empire. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth that devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. The same word, diverse. Famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. Fourth empire, an empire diverse from all empires before it. What's being said here is the conditions result from the diversity of what the fourth empire Luciferians are doing. They're fragmenting, they're bringing in conditions that only guidance of the Holy Spirit will give understanding that pertains to it. <clears throat> the warnings that Jesus gave deal with the Christians who are going to be involved in the diverse circumstances that are holding them back from being ready for the rapture. In the church at Pergamos, he talks about <clears throat> the attention is being diverted is going to cause them to suffer a judgment. <clears throat> says, I'll come and I'll speak against you with the sword of my mouth. Church at Ephesus, the same thing. Says, I'll take your candlestick out of its place. Each one is dealing with a different condition because of the influence of the Luciferians. We're entering into that place now there's a fragmentation taking place in the different areas that people find themselves when we're dealing with different circumstances. Upheavals, prosperity, sin, deception, all things engineered to keep them from tapping into the source that would give them understanding and enable them to be free of the condition. <coughs> Turn to Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. So what we find here is the ten virgins at the start of their journey. They take their lamps and they went forth. So it's symbolizing the start. At the start, all ten are in unity of purpose. They understand the most important thing is to meet the bridegroom. They understand the most important thing is to have the oil with the lamps. They understand 
that they wouldn't leave without them. <clears throat> so they all start off with the same definite purpose. Now drop down to verse 6. And at midnight. Why does he choose the term midnight? Why not 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 8 o'clock? Because midnight symbolizes the time of the greatest darkness. He's talking here about a time when the darkness influence will be at its height. When the human mind will be at its lowest point in comprehending what's taking place. A time in which the lamp and the oil must be operating at the maximum to enable them to see to get to the bridegroom. So what he's saying here deals with the importance of having the illumination of the Holy Spirit consistently from the beginning to the end. The five foolish didn't make it because when it was needed the most, it was not available. They're in the dark. What does that mean? That means that they're no longer applying the Holy Spirit's guidance. They have no guidance. They're human-oriented guidance isn't getting them anywhere. they got to go and find the oil. And they do. But they get, of course, when they get back, it's too late. Principle, those not in tune with their own renewing process will not experience the change. Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 10 to 11. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So he's saying here that the, the senses are dead as far as guiding you where you need to go, as far as giving you direction and understanding. It's neutralized. It's the spirit that dominates all things at this point. Verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. The rapture is a change, the end of a line of changes in which the Holy Spirit changes the totality of the physical to the spiritual, enhancing what was corrupted into what is now divine. Filling the life with the fullness of the Spirit. The power, the splendor, the glory, everything. The Holy Spirit at this point, in other words, is released to totally fill, complete God's design for that life that He purposed back in Romans 8, 28-30, back in eternity past. He now is allowed to expand to the fullest because that life is ready. Scripture teaches after the rapture the world will turn on Christians. The first great martyrdom will take place. All those Christians that were in the conditions that were keeping them from comprehending what was taking place, groping in the dark, not understanding what's taking place. Instantaneously, after the rapture, they will enter into the beginning of sorrows in which the whole world will be incited against them. And they will gather up the first group and they will experience martyrdom. Matthew 24 verses 8 to 9. 
All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So we find two things. From verse 7 to verse 9, there's a radical change in the human race. Verse 7, <clears throat> man is pitted against himself, destroy his civilization. Verse 9, men are pitted against Christians. And they round them up, deliver them to the kings, the rulers, who martyred them. Turn to Revelation, 6th chapter, verses 9 to 10. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. That's this first group. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? White robes are given unto every one of them, it was sent unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were. So, what it's talking about here is this group. <clears throat> the picture that you get is you have the elite group that went in the rapture. They're seated around the throne. The Lord is opening the mystery scrolls of the seven seals. And as he opens each scroll, a revelation takes place. I believe at the same time as the group is seated around the throne glorifying God, singing their testimony, this group is coming up under the altar, being butchered, martyred for their faith. The revelation of them isn't given until the next chapter, verse 6, because the seals aren't open until that time. But they're there, and they are a testimony to what happens to Christians that were not ready. Christians who allowed the conditions that took place on the earth to disqualify them from the rapture. So in that sense, you're going to have a steady stream of um, souls going up there because they're going to be butchered steadily by a world that's turned against Christians. It didn't just, it's not just a one-time thing. Once they turn on Christians, they hunt them down wherever they find them. So Christians are going to be living together in groups in seclusion. And at a certain time, <coughs> they're going to be brought forth and killed and their souls go up before the throne in a consistent stream. So what we have here is the understanding that what we're entering into now is not going to be understood to a great degree by the human mind. Unsaved people won't stand a chance once this thing begins to manifest. Most of them will wind up being deceived <clears throat> going down to the judgments that take place later on in the tribulation period. Christians, the, the, the tribulation period is for Christians, it's not for unsaved people. It's to give Christians a second chance to make good, to be put into position that God has for them so that they can complete, fulfill the plan that God has for them, the day themselves disqualify themselves from the 